As we progress through Ezekiel, we're going to find that repeatedly we'll be dealing with symbolic uh, sermons, um, little uh, sermons that are going to be acted out, and we'll be starting with those, uh, a, a series of those, beginning next week. This week we're in, uh, we'll be in chapter 2. Now these first three chapters of Ezekiel will be understood better if we look at them as though they had no chapter divisions. You, you know, when the Bible was originally written, it wasn't in chapters and verses. We uh, divided it that way in order to uh, be able to uh, have cross-referencing and so forth. But uh, many times the, the sense will be better if we just read straight through. For instance, look in the last verse of Ezekiel 1, and let's start right in the middle of the verse, that's Ezekiel 1, 28, where it says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord, and when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke, and he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. Now, you see, uh, somebody chose to put a, a, a chapter division right in the middle of a thought, didn't they? It, it's obvious that uh, the last half of tw verse 28 there uh, goes with, uh, with the first verse in chapter 2. And Ezekiel uh, fell there on his face as a result of uh, having this, seen this vision of the glory of God. And if you have been reading your Bible, uh, you have seen this frequently. You'll see it again, for instance, in Ezekiel chapter 3. Uh, and when Daniel saw a similar vision in Daniel chapter 8, uh, he is said to have fallen upon his face. You find the same thing uh, when Paul saw a vision of the glory of God, and when John saw his light vision in Revelation chapter 1. Then uh, other times when uh, man was confronted with the presence of God, for instance, Moses and Aaron or Joshua, in Joshua chapter 5, when he saw the captain of the Lord of hosts, which was uh, what in the Old Testament is known as a Christophany, that is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Jesus Christ is everlasting, the Bible says. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's from everlasting to everlasting. There never has been a time when God the Son was not. This is why he could tell the people of his day, before Abraham was... I am, and he has been carrying on his work in regards to man long before he was born in Bethlehem's manger. In uh, the first chapter of Colossians and in other places, we're told that he had the preeminence in the creation. Uh, the, your creator is the triune God. However, the preeminent one in that creation is God the Son. In the Old Testament, the people were led by Jehovah. The name for God that you find throughout this book of Ezekiel is Jehovah. It's spelled Lord in our King James Version with all of the letters capitals, the L-O-R-D, all in capitals. And Jehovah is the name of God as he has to do with man. It's God directing his attention manward, and that is, that is the Jehovah God. And so this is, many times you will hear it said that the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. Now if that confuses you, just remember that he is eternal and he has the preeminent position, whether he was dealing primarily through the nation of Israel or whether his dealings were primarily uh, through the church as they are today, since he is the head of the church. But when mortal man in the past has been confronted with the, the, the nearness of the presence of the glory of God, he's fallen flat on his face. If you have a cross-reference Bible, uh, you can find the cross-references to this uh, phrase, I fell in on my face, or this clause, I fell upon my face, and you'll find that it was a frequent occurrence, it was always when man realized he was in the presence of God. 
I'm always remembered of, of a time just a few months after I was saved, the Christian Businessmen's Committee of Lakeland held a layman's crusade in the old May Hall Auditorium. And uh, the, uh, uh, I was uh, asked there to, uh, to give my testimony. It's the first time I ever gave a public testimony of how Christ came into my heart. Well, every morning before we would begin the day and go out into the places of business and witness, and uh, we would gather together down at the New Florida Hotel in the phosphate room for a prayer meeting uh, early each morning. And I remember one morning that some of the early arrivals were sitting around talking about what they would do the first time they ever uh, saw Jesus face to face. And one would say, well, I'm going to do this, and the other would say, well, I'm going to thank him for this, or I'm going to ask him this, and they were having a, uh, a lot of fun, you know, just enjoyment, uh, uh, supposing or, or discussing what they would do when they first saw him. About that time, a fellow came walking through the door uh, by the name of Fred Roan. Now, Fred's a used car dealer from the city of Mobile, Alabama, and he walked there where these fellows were, and uh, so somebody just says, Fred, what would you do? What are you going to do? the first time you see Jesus face to face. Well, he kind of considered the question a moment, and without saying a word, he threw himself prone right straight down on the floor and, and lay there. And uh, so when we thought it was time, somebody tried to help him get up, you know, and uh, he says, that's what I'm going to do. And, the, and I'll tell you how I know it. And then he turned to some of these scriptures. Uh, he says... Uh, when I first see him face to face, now I don't know if that's really the reaction Fred will have because uh, at that time he will be in his glorified body rather than this uh, body of clay, and it may be that that won't be necessary. But it, it made a dramatic impression upon me, <laughs> I'll assure you, as a, as a brand new Christian. So the Lord says here in chapter 2, Stand up on your feet, Ezekiel. And uh, I don't know whether he had the strength to do that or not, except in the second verse it says, The Spirit entered into me, and he spoke unto me, and set me upon my feet. <laughs> That's how he got up. Uh, that wasn't necessary, I don't guess, in Fred's case, but uh, it was necessary here. And that I heard him who spoke unto me, and he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel. Remember, we said before that this name, Son of man is the one which is usually used for Ezekiel in, uh, in this book. He calls himself that, and God calls him that. And this is the name that Jesus took for himself, if you remember, to uh, stress the fact that he had become a son of man. And remember verses like, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. This was his favorite name for himself when he was here on earth, the Son of Man. And uh, someone has counted the number of times that Ezekiel is called by this name, and uh, I, I believe it's 90-some times, and, uh, and I believe it's 70-some times that Jesus calls himself by that name. And they're the only two individuals uh, that uh, are given this appellation, except in one instance, I believe an angel calls Daniel son of man. And that's in the seventh chapter of Daniel. But this is the name by which God addresses him. Son of man. Verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this day. Now it's important that he says, they and their fathers. And he's going to repeat this quite a few times because later on in the book of Ezekiel, the, uh, the leaders, the, the spiritual leaders among Israel are going to make an accusation against God. And you know what their accusation is going to be? They're going to say, God, you're punishing us for our father's sins. The way it's going to be expressed is this, our fathers ate sour grapes, and you have set our teeth on edge. And uh, so God's going to make it plain here that 
their sins are the same of the sins of their fathers. So they say, well, why are you going to treat us different from the way you treated our fathers? Well, sin has a way of accumulating as far as its consequences are concerned. And uh, when God can uh, brook it no longer, then, uh, then he does something about it. Also notice that he says, I send thee to the children of Israel. God is in a father-child relationship. All through this chapter, they'll be referred to as his children and as part of his household. When you see this word house of Israel, he's talking about his household. Now, we'll get all mixed up if we don't realize that uh, uh, Israel here is in the, in the uh, family of God as a nation. That does not mean every individual Israelite was saved, but uh, they were his child uh, as, a, as a nation. He said, I have called my son out of Egypt. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, in Hosea 11.1. 1. It refers to a passage in, uh, in Exodus where uh, God uh, said to Pharaoh through Moses, let my son go. He speaks of Israel as the children of Israel, all the, all the nation, as being part of his household. So what he's doing, he's carrying on a discipline within his own household. Now, if you want to see the uh, uh, continuity of that situation on through into the New Testament, hold your place here in Ezekiel and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And God will apply this same principle to, uh, to the people of our time. Uh, Hebrews 10, verse 26. For if we, that is, we who are in the family of God, if we, children of God, sin willfully or presumptuously, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. In other words, we've already availed ourselves of the death of Christ once, so God's got to do something else. He can't put Christ on the cross again for us, and we've sinned. So we must do something else. But there's a certain uh, fearful looking for of judgment and of fiery indignation, that same judgment and fiery indignation that shall devour the adversary. And then he goes on and makes an analogy. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. He's talking about the children of Israel. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye Shall, be he thought, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant with which he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despot under the Spirit of grace? He's comparing what God must do concerning a sinning child of God now with that. He said, if I didn't let sin go un unnoticed when you were under Moses' law, how do you think I could now? Uh, when, uh, when I've gone, when you can look back and see to what extremes I've gone to provide you with a salvation. Verse 30, for we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me, and here it is, I, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people, those who are in his household. Now, this is going to be rather important when we get over into the chapters 9, 10, and 11, where we're going to see the glory of God departing from the temple of God. God has a temple today, and his glory will not manifest itself within that temple under every circumstance. And we'll see this applied to ourselves and particularly to the sinning Christian when we, uh, when we get to those chapters. But I, I, it, it's so important because you're going to see it later on tonight how some well-meaning uh, evangelists get us all mixed up by trying to apply the truths that are taught here uh, to unsaved people. 
these instructions and these applications are to God's household. Now, it wasn't hard to see when we went over to Hebrews chapter 10 that we were speaking in both instances of people that were in the family of God, weren't we? Because he said those who were given Moses' law, was anybody in the Old Testament given the law of Moses other than the nation of Israel? No, it was not a law for the nations of the world. And then he goes on and he he says, judgment must begin in the house of God. Have how much sorrow? And he compares it to us, those who have uh, received uh, the, um, the benefit of the, the sacrifice that Christ made for us. So we want to be sure that we understand that we're speaking of a father-child relationship. God is going to discipline the members of his family. Any of you that have any questions at all about eternal security or the ultimate uh, position of a sinning Christian, uh, I, I'm sure that if it can be cleared up in your minds at all, that it will be thoroughly cleared up uh, through this study in Ezekiel, because it will be so clear just what God does in those circumstances. Verse 3 again, And he said unto me, Son of man, send, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even to this very day, for they are an impudent children. See? They are members of the family, but they're rebellious members, and they've been impudent to their parental authority. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do not send you, Ezekiel, I do send you, Ezekiel, unto them, and thou shalt say, I got this uh, confused with a verse we're going to have in a little while, where he's going to say, I do not send you uh, to somebody, but I hear you, it's I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. Now this word, Lord God, is a compound name of God, and it can best be translated Master Jehovah. In other words, they should be calling Jehovah Master. The Hebrew name is, is Adonai Jehovah. Adonai Yahweh or, or Adonai Jehovah it means uh, God who has a relationship to man and who is master. Verse 5, and they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are, are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. Now, you, you're going to find this phrase, whether they hear or whether they forbear, quite frequently, because it's going to become obvious that most of them won't hear. They, they're going to uh, refuse to receive the message, yet... He says, they're going to know that there's been a prophet among them. Notice that uh, Ezekiel is called a prophet. Back in chapter 1, verse 3, he was called Ezekiel the priest. So in one chapter, he's called a priest. The next chapter, he's called a prophet. We uh, discussed this before. It, you're permitted. God was permitted to make ordain a man both prophet and priest, but never could a king be a priest. A prophet could be a priest, and a priest could be a prophet, but a king could not be a priest until Christ comes. And Christ is prophet, priest, and king. Again, we might uh, make sure you understand the difference between a priest and a prophet. A priest is a man who speaks to God for men. A prophet is a man who speaks to man for God. Christ was a prophet. He was in his prophetic office when he was here on earth because he was speaking to men for God. He was a man. That's necessary. He must be a man. And he must speak to men for God. 
That was when he was here. Now he's a priest. He's a man and in, in the heavens, and he's speaking to God for men. Ezekiel was both prophet and priest, and so are we. We're called to be. We're ordained to be both prophet and priest. We're to speak to men for God, and we're to speak to God for men. The Bible says, pray for all men. So we, we, we are ordained both, just as Ezekiel is here. In the little prophetic book of Amos, Amos chapter 3, verse 7, God says, Surely I will do nothing unless I reveal it to my holy prophets. He says, I don't ever do anything manward until I first tell them about it. And that's why, uh, Ezekiel, I'm calling you out. I'm going to do something. That's what that vision was all about in the first chapter. God is doing things, and he's about to do something very spectacular, manward, on earth. And it's an it's a, uh, action of judgment. But he's not going to do it without bringing word first. And he says, they're going to know there was a prophet. They're going to know that there was a man who was speaking for God to men. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words. Be not dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. He says, don't be afraid, Ezekiel. He gave these same words to another young prophet priest just a few years previous to this, the prophet Jeremiah. For Jeremiah prophesied about one generation uh, before Ezekiel did. And he was still prophesying when Ezekiel came on the scene only. Jeremiah was prophesying back with the people who were still in Jerusalem, and Ezekiel was prophesying to those who'd been carried uh, to captivity. Remember, uh, five years before Ezekiel started prophesying, he was carried with 10,000 of the choicest of the people from his home country, Israel, over to the foreign country, Babylon. Uh, some others, of course, of those were Daniel and the three Hebrew children that we sing about. But Jeremiah was left with those who were in Jerusalem still under a puppet king. And remember, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed some six years after Ezekiel sees his vision and begins his ministry. Uh, when Jeremiah was called to start his prophetic utterance, he says, don't call on me, Lord, I'm just a child, and um, I, I just, I don't think I'm the one, really, and God says, Jeremiah, don't be afraid, you can read that in Jeremiah chapter 1, then he says, Ezekiel, it's going to be like you're in a, in a a wooded area just full of briars and thorns. I grew up on a farm up in North Florida, and uh, the woods around where I grew up, you just couldn't walk through them, most of them, because there was these just profusion of what, what we called uh, bramble briars, and, and then uh, cat claw blackberry vines that grew way up into the trees. And boy, I mean, they just rip you apart if you tried to uh, to go through there. I really understand what it means, thorns and briars. And I understand scorpions, too. Um, when I was a boy, we used to split rails. Now, if you thought that was for back in another century, uh, it was... Uh, my, our whole farm was not fenced with rail fences, but um, 
You see, you'd pen the cattle up here for uh, uh, three or four weeks uh, so that uh, the ground would get good and fertilized so you could plant a garden. And then you needed a fence that you could pick up and move the cow pen over here. We, every, few month, every few weeks, we moved the cow pen uh, so that uh, eventually, you know, a large area uh, would get ready. So you, you did this better with, uh, with uh, rail fences, you know, these zigzagging ones like that. Well, we used to cut them right out of the, I don't know, anybody here knows about splitting rails, but in case you ever have to split rails, you, if you're using an iron wedge, you use a wooden maul, but if you're using a, a wooden wedge, you use a, a, a steel sledgehammer. Now, that may be helpful uh, to you, but I can give you some other instructions along those lines if, uh, if you uh, find that you have occasion to need them. But anyway, in these rails uh, where there would be a splinter or something that had not uh, just pulled a little way away from the rest of the rail, would be a favorite hiding place for scorpions and black widow spiders. spiders. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, if you've never been stung by the tail of a scorpion, you really don't know what hurt means. Uh, because uh, they're mean, and uh, he, what God is doing, now, this kind of scorpions that you have in this area, if you get out in the right locale, are exactly the same as they had over in Israel, and they're uh, uh, out in the country, I think they call them centipedes, uh, that's just a Florida backwoods name for scorpions because it really is not a correct, a centipede means a hundred feet, and uh, that's something else, but we call them centipedes anyway. But they're scorpions. And uh, what God is saying, Ezekiel, sometimes you're going to feel like you're trying to walk through bramble briars and cat claw briars, and uh, you're going to you're going to think you're being stung by scorpions. He's talking about their words and their slurs. See, he says uh, in this last part of the sixth verse, Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed by their looks, though they are, though they are a rebellious house. Don't be afraid, Ezekiel. Verse 7, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. See, that's the second time we've sung. For they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat what I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent out unto me, and lo, a book, or that is to say, a scroll, the, the, it's a rolled up scroll, was in it. And he spread it before me, and it was uh, written uh, on the front and the back, and both sides of it, that was fairly common with scrolls. And there was writing in it, written in it, lamentations and mourning and woe. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat what thou findest, eat this scroll, or this book, or the roll of this book, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat the scroll. And he said unto me, Son of man, eat it, cause thy belly to eat it, and fill thy bowels with this uh, scroll that I give thee. <laughs> then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth like honey for sweetness. Now, you might ask, did Ezekiel actually eat this? Did he put it in his mouth and chomp, 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 and then swallow it, whoop, like that? Well, I don't know whether he did or not. Uh, sometimes God uses these figures of speech, and uh, he doesn't really let you know whether it's a figure or whether it's, uh, we know that it's figurative language, I mean, that we know that he's showing something by a figure, but whether or not uh, Ezekiel actually literally ate 
this scroll or not. We don't know. But I doubt it because, you see, God, uh, Christ used this same type of language when he says, except ye eat my flesh and drink my blood, uh, you won't have any life. And then he went on to explain that uh, uh, he's speaking of spiritual things, that the flesh profiteth nothing, but the spirit is truth and life. I believe this, you'll find this in the latter part of the sixth chapter of John. And there are two other prophets in the Bible who speak of eating uh, the words of God. Or uh, uh, Jeremiah said, I, did find thy, I found thy words and I did eat them, and they were a joy and rejoicing to my heart. And he says, because thou art my God. This would be Jeremiah 16, 15. And then uh, it might help us to get a little insight concerning uh, Ezekiel's uh, meal here if we uh, see what happened on a like occasion to the prophet John in Revelation chapter 10. So we might want to turn there now, Revelation 10, 9. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now, the figure, if we take all of these instances, plus we see what else the Bible has to say about the word of God being sweet like honey, you'll find this figure used in, twice in the Psalms, in Psalm 19 and again in Psalm 119, where the word of God is said to taste as sweet as honey. The thought is, that it's sweet to the taste because God lets the prophet know that, it, that the words are his words, and God is good, and God is wise. And so uh, there's a, a God purpose in his speaking these words, and he's most privileged to be able to speak God's words, and therefore the words are sweet in his mouth. After all, Ezekiel is a human being, and John is a human being, and the things that he's going to say are going to be very, very dire to his fellow human beings. He's going to, for instance, he's going to prophesy here that people will get so hungry that they'll eat their children, and he's going to prophesy all kind of terrible things happening to his fellow human beings because they will not repent of their sins. The same thing true was with John. Now, eating this word, you see, it's just like, it's the same figure that we have when we partake of what we call communion. The picture is that just as the bread and uh, uh, the wine becomes a part of us and uh, permeates every bit of our being, I mean, in a little while, you couldn't find where it is because it's everywhere in your body. Your body assimilates it, and it becomes one with you. Well, in the same way, these words which the prophets are to speak are to be just as much a part of them as the breakfast they had until they cannot but uh, say what has to be said. It's that much a part of them. It's sweet because it's God's word, and it's bitter because of the just the horror. Now, I, I understand a little bit about this because the Lord leads me every so often to teach a Bible lesson about the horrors of hell. And if you're going to 
teach the Bible very much, you just have to do this. God's, God wants his people, not just the unsaved, but he wants his people reminded of the horrors of hell. Now, we ought to know this because whoever he sent to speak to man has described hell. Jesus spent a good portion of his words while, on, while he was on earth describing the awful, awfulness of an eternity uh, uh, after, after judgment, after condemnation on the part of God. And it's not easy. If God lays upon you a burden to unfold hell to the best extent that you can using scriptural words, it's not any fun. Now, you're privileged to be able to speak forth God's word, but you don't like the message. And of course, I suppose that's one of the main reasons why you hear very few messages about hell in the average pulpit. I suppose that if the average paid preacher would spend the same percentage of his words on hell as Christ did, or as Paul did, that uh, the church wouldn't have him. Most churches wouldn't have him. They'd find somebody else, because they would accuse him of being obsessed with that subject. I'm talking about just as he, if he, uh, if he spoke in the same relationship, or the same percentage-wise, as the New Testament does in general, the, uh, the congregation would get a new preacher. And uh, because we just don't want, we go to church maybe once a week or twice at the most, and we don't want to take that little time uh, with that type of a message. I suppose that's why God lays it upon the heart of somebody like me that's not a paid preacher to bring that type of message fairly frequently, because it's not brought as much as God would have it brought to his people. And so... Uh, the words are sometimes bitter as well as sweet. And he tells here, you see in the tenth verse, written within and without, and there was written in it lamentations and mourning and woe. <laughs> That's not what we pay our preachers to bring us, lamentations and mourning and woe, is it? I hope you see that I'm laying the blame not on the spokesman, but on the hearer. And the Bible does that. It says that we heap up to ourselves those that will tickle our ears. There wouldn't be any such thing as pro false prophets if hearers didn't like the words that they say. There just wouldn't be any. There would be no false spokesman at all if he had no hearers. Now, many times there would be speakers for God even though he'd have no hearers. Isaiah said, uh, uh, when God called Isaiah to preach, he said, Isaiah, none of them are going to hear you. You're not going to have any converts. Told Noah the same thing. You're going to preach. Noah told Noah he's going to preach for 120 years. Wouldn't have any converts. So many times the spokesmen for God are called upon to preach and speak when nobody will hear. But there wouldn't be any such thing as false spokesmen without hearers. A false spokesman can always find somebody that will hear his message and, and heed his message. He can gather hearers to himself. but. Uh, a true spokesman may or may not be able to, depending upon the situation. That ought to tell us something about ourselves, hadn't it? Chapter 3, Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, eat what thou findest, eat this book, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to uh, eat the book. And he said unto me, Son of man, uh, eat and fill thy stomach with this scroll which I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth like honey for sweetness. 
Then he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent. Now here was the verse that I was confused with. Thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. And I know, and no doubt God has reference here to the prophet Jonah. You know, uh, Jonah was called to be a prophet, and, and he prophesied several hundred years before Ezekiel did. And he was sent to the heathen city of Nineveh. And they repented, remember? And uh, he didn't want to go there, but uh, he, he went to a city that repented. Well, Ezekiel is being said, you're going to go to a people that speaks your own language. And uh, they're not going to repent. Verse 7, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impotent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads, like an adamant, harder than flint, have I made thy, uh, thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. He says <laughs> their scorpions and their thorns and their briars are not going to hurt you, because I'm going to make you impervious to such. This word adamant is a word for a very hard stone. It would be like a, a diamond or something on that order. Uh, anything that would be used to sharpen anything else. It's hard enough to sharpen anything else. You'd have to have an adamant, for instance, to sharpen a flint stone. And uh, that's why he says it's harder than flint. You can't sharpen a, a flint stone except you have something that's harder than a flint stone, can you? And he says that's that's how how hard I'm going to make you, how impervious I'm going to make you. So to speak, they could sharpen a, an arrow with a flint head, just as sharp as they wanted to, and shoot it right straight at you, and the point would break. That's how hard I'm going to make. Uh, uh, that's how resistant I'm going to make you. So you say anything you want, they're not going to be able to hurt you. Isn't, doesn't God use colorful language to uh, get his point across? Verse 10, Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears, and go get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people. See, over and over again, children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus... Uh, saith the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. The third time we see that. Then this, uh, then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great Russian saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from this place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the uh, wheels over against them, and a noise of great rushing. Here again, he's seeing this same vision, and the picture is God is about to do something. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Now, the bitterness as he's speaking about is the bitterness of the words in his belly, you might say. The, the bitterness, it doesn't mean that he was bitter against God, or he's saying, God, don't you do this to me. It means, and he wasn't bitter against the people. It was just the, the terrible, oppressive uh, nature of his message is, uh, is what he's trying to get across to. But it's like the other prophets that said, he cannot but speak the words that God had given to him. This is what we mean by the heat of his spirit. It's, he could do no other, even though it was a, a message that embittered him because it was lamentations and mourning and woe. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. By the way, if you want to uh, get the meaning of a word like bitter here, and what does it mean? Because if you just read this one verse at first reading, it, you, you'd get the wrong impression. Well, just find out how the same word is used elsewhere in proximity to the, to the Scripture, and, it, and it'll clear it up for you. Verse 15, Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv. Now, this word Tel Aviv means hill, 
uh, where there's a lot of grain, uh, of abundant grain. I suppose this is where they get Tel Aviv in Israel today. These and these are the same. Uh, in many languages, these Spanish students can uh, vouch for that. that uh, so this could be V-I-V or B-I-V, either one. You can say Havana or Havana, either one. And dwelt by the river Kibar, and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished or overwhelmed among them seven days. Now, what God is doing, he has given Ezekiel a message and then he's transported them to the people to whom God wants the message delivered. But Ezekiel is powerless to speak, and he's just there silently for seven days. But they know that he has a message to say. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning for me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked of his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Now you notice I left out one word. I left out an italicized word, the word man. It's not in the original and probably its insertion by the translator has given rise to some of the confusion that comes uh, by the way this particular verse and others like it are used. If this is a favorite, for instance, if you're going to have a revival in your church and the first two or three nights the message is supposed to be to the saved people and you're supposed to get out your whiplash and, 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 and whip them into getting out there and making the visitations to drive the unsaved in. And if they don't, well, they got blood dripping from their hands or they're going to get to heaven one day and they're going to see hell and see all those people writhing in hell that uh, uh, God intended for them to bring to the revival services and they didn't. Their blood's on your hands. You know, uh, this is a... I don't... Haven't you heard messages like that? I've heard quite a few. Their, their blood is... I, I, I can just see the man standing up here in the podium, see? And he'll say, And their blood! And their blood! Is on your hands! Well, that's a wrong application of this scripture. Now, uh, we'll do that for you maybe a little more dramatically when we get to the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. Uh, I'll tell you something about uh, uh, this book of Ezekiel. There are many parallel chapters. The 33rd chapter is parallel to the 3rd chapter, and the, 60, the, the 36th chapter is parallel to the 6th chapter. We don't take time to do that right now, but when we get to the 6th chapter, we will. And uh, you'll see why, because you see... The, the book's divided right in half. First half concerns pronouncements of judgment, which pronouncements were made before the fall of Jerusalem. Then those uh, pronouncements that are made in the last half of the book, beginning with chapter 25, were spoken by Ezekiel after the fall of Jerusalem. And many of these things are repeated, but in a little different way. And you'll find much of the third chapter of Ezekiel in the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. So we'll, uh, we'll wait till we get there because uh, more of the scriptures that are used in this manner are found in the 33rd chapter. But it's a misuse of this scripture to use it as a whip to whip Christians into witnessing. This is not what this scripture is speaking about. And it's not even a proper application. Because you see, it's it's speaking of the blood of unsaved people on the hands of saved people. And what God is doing here, he's calling Ezekiel to warn the people that are in his own household. And really, the wicked here is the nation. It's, it's really speaking more of the death of a nation. And it's doing it by an analogy. God is saying, look, if someone is appointed to be a, a watchman and along comes the enemy army 
and the watchman just lets them come. Well, obviously, he's responsible for everybody that gets killed. But if he sees the enemy coming and he says to flee, and he gives the warning in plenty of time, and the people just say, ah, you're making a, you're beating your gums. And then they come and get killed. Now, he was set up to be a watchman, and he warned them, and they didn't heed the war warning. Then they're responsible for their own deaths, aren't they? Well, he's saying this, Ezekiel, I'm calling you to warn Israel as a nation, and Israel will die. In their sin, the nation will die. And you get the parallel to this over in uh, the, uh, the Valley of Dry Bones. You're going to see the dead, they did die, and they're coming back to life again. And so primarily, the wicked here is the nation of Israel, and the one that's going to die is Israel the nation, if they don't pay attention. And here again, this represents the Christian who will not pay attention. And we'll get into that, as I say, as we go along. But get that perspective, and you'll get the, you'll get the real meaning as far as you're concerned. Now, there is a, a very, very pointed warning here to save people. But the warning is not that if you don't witness to your lost uh, friends, you're going to end up in heaven with blood on your hands. That's not the warning. I hate to make you wait clear to the 33rd chapter to, to see it clearly, but maybe that'll uh, get you to come back. <laughs> Verse 18. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to, the, uh, to warn the wicked uh, from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turns not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul from the responsibility of the, uh, of the fellow getting killed, in other words. Again, when a, righteous, uh, when a righteous man or nation or what have you doth turn from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, that's the stumbling block here is the invading army of, uh, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and... Uh, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the uh, righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also, he has, uh, thou hast delivered thy soul. This is the way it's supposed to work. If Israel will give heed to what you're saying, then Israel will live. If Israel doesn't, they'll die but you, you will have fulfilled your obligation. And the hand of the Lord was upon me there, and he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain, and I will, talk, I will there talk with thee. Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and beheld the glory of the Lord stood there like the glory which I saw by the river of Kebar, and I fell on my face. There it is again. Now, next week we're going to start with verse 22, and we're going to tie it in, and we'll do from verse 22 uh, the rest of chapter Three, all of chapter 4 and all of chapter 5. And you're going to see uh, uh, Ezekiel is going to be doing some drama. He's going to be doing uh, uh, his preaching in pantomime because God's going to stop his mouth up and he's not going to be able to speak with words for about 14 or 15 months. And he's going to preach by uh, acting on a stage rather than by speaking with his mouth. And then after the uh, after the 14 or 15 months, they're going to hear. Some of them will pay attention to what he says, but it takes that long to get their attention. So he's going to do it in pantomime. And these two uh, chapters, 4 and 5, are very interesting and very instructive. And I think we can uh, come up with just exactly what Ezekiel is saying, although he won't be saying a word. Now, once again, I want to impress upon you that these words are to the house of Israel. So let's go back and, and look in chapter 2, verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the lost of the world. No. 
uh, verse 4. They are impudent children and stiff heart. I do send thee unto them. Verse 5, uh, last phrase, a prophet among them. Chapter 3, verse 1, last line, and go speak unto the house of Israel. Verse 4, and he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. Verse 6, not to many people of a strange tongue. Verse 7, but to the house of Israel. And uh, verse 11, and go get thee uh, to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them. This should uh, impress us with the fact that this message and this instruction is primarily to a specific people and a specific class of people. And we need to be very careful when we, when we use such <coughs> scriptures to apply to someone else. We must be sure that the application is valid. Now, you can make an application to the church from these scriptures, that's all right, but you must be sure that the application is valid. If we were going to go on over and compare this with the 33rd chapter now, if, if you want to do a little reading of your own on that chapter, you'll notice that it speaks of keeping the law and if you do what is lawful, you'll be saved. Well, that's not the message we tell people, is it? If you keep the law, you'll be saved. That's how we can know it's to the nation of Israel. If Israel had kept the law, would Israel have been saved as a nation? Surely. They wouldn't have uh, been desecrated uh, over the mountains of the world for 25 centuries. They would have been a live nation all those, uh, all those times. So uh, this, is the, this is the picture that we're being shown. There is a valid application, as I said, to us, and we'll make that application, and we trust that you'll be able to see that it is a valid application when we, uh, when we get ready to make it. And just a few more words of, um, of reminder, and we'll be saying this that I'm going to say now. We'll be saying it several times. Ezekiel is very interesting to us for this reason. The main thrust of his prophecies concerning concern two specific times in the history of the world. Number one, the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Those events which surround the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. This is a phrase used by the Lord himself to speak of a particular time, particular period of years uh, that uh, is some 2,600 years. He's prophesying, one, about the events that surround the beginning of the times of the Gentiles, approximately 2,600 years ago. And also, he is prophesying about the events which surround the end of the times of the Gentiles. His prophecies are very pointed. And the prophecies that he gave us concerning the beginning have been fulfilled in minute detail, very precisely. That should help us to believe that the prophecies that have to do with the end of the time of the Gentiles, which are upon us, and which, have, which has not yet occurred, the end, it would, should help us to understand that those prophecies will be fulfilled just as precisely. And this, is, this forms the great intrigue in this book for us. We're going to learn how pointedly, how precisely these events were prophesied and just a few months later they came upon, uh, about. Then we're going to be able to detect that he gives other prophecies just as detailed, just as pointed, which have not yet come to pass. But we can see the foreshadowing of this second set of events. You see these events, as I say, 26 or so hundred years apart. And he's prophesied very little concerning the interim years. So this should make the book live for us as we, uh, as we go along. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you again that uh, all scripture is given by inspiration 
from God, and that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, and for reproof, and for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect or complete and fully furnished unto every good work. So we pray that we would take the book of Ezekiel in this light. In Jesus' name, amen.